Anita Perez Acosta in conversation with Benedito Ferrao while we wait for him to join us. Let me just read out the brief introductions and he, he should be joining in. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> Usha Alexander is the author of the novels The Legend of Birinara and Only the Eyes Are Mine and the novelette Vive Idaho. Her writing has been featured in Three Quarks Daily and Scroll Note In. is forthcoming in the Punch magazine and has appeared in various <coughs> other publications including anthologies like the best American travel stories. She worked for many years at uh, Apple after having returned from Guanajuato, a Pacific <coughs> Island nation, where she taught secondary school science as a US Peace Corps volunteer. She maintains an abiding interest in science, anthropology, and history. She grew up in Pocatello, Idaho, a remote little town in the Rocky Mountain region of the USA. Though currently residing in the National Capital Region of India, she carries her home within herself. You will find her on the web at ushaalexander.com. We also have here Sunita Perez Costa, who was born in Sydney, Australia, to parents of Goan origin. She has published and produced across the genres of fiction, non-fiction, playwriting and poetry. Her debut no novel, Homework, was published by Bloomsbury in 1999. A no novella, Saudade, on the legacies of a Portuguese colonialism and the Goan diaspora in Angola, was published by Gira Mondo in March 2018. Her literary honours include a Fulbright Scholarship, the Australia Council for the Arts, uh, we are Whitting Residency and recently an Asia Link Arts Creative Exchange to the Australian and New Zealand Studies Centre at Himachal Pradesh University. She holds a BA in Communication from the University of Technology, Sydney and a Master of Fine Arts in Writing from Sarah Lawrence College, New York. Uh, Benedito Ferrar has lived and worked in Kuwait, India, the United States, England and Australia. A writer and academic, he is currently an assistant professor of English and Asian and Pacific Islander American Studies at the College of William and Ben. In 2017-18, he curated the art exhibition Goa, Portugal, Mozambique, The Many Lives of Mamona Navalkar uh, at the Fundasau Orient Gallery in Goa and edited a book of the same title published by Fumisa to accompany his retrospective of Navalkar's art. His fiction and non-fiction appear in Riksha, The Goodman Project, Mizna and other publications. Over to you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you for the kind introductions. Um, before we begin, our panelists would like to say a few words in, in opening our session. <coughs> Um, celebrates the plurality and diversity of India and Indian literature. We want we wanted to honour the memory of Asbabano, who died earlier this year. And that's we want to start. Thank you so much. Um, so Ush and Sunita, I want to begin with uh, a, a broad reflection perhaps on um, the, the issue of diaspora, which is the theme of our panel. So if we, if we think of the, the diaspora as essentially being people from a particular location um, having a home elsewhere from their homeland, right? Um, it suggests a relationship between the, the homeland and this other place, right? Um, so in addition to being uh, a, a diasporic relationship, 
uh, between people at the home lab and these other locations, there's also a transnational relationship that crosses across that, that goes across borders, right? But within this, there's also the sense of self that immigrants or transnationals create uh, for themselves. So even as much as they negotiate their sense of identity as people and some of their home lands or people in a new nation, um, they're also negotiating a sense of self. How do you find this playing out in your work or in your lives, or is it something that you don't even consciously think of as you construct the characters in the books and the narratives that you write? Is Um, I would say definitely, most definitely, it is something uh, that I have very consciously thought about in my writing and in the creation of characters. And my first book in particular was um, in some ways that typical first novel where those are the issues that I'm dealing with and it's a story about uh, characters who move from India to the United States. and. The, the next generation, how they deal with those questions. Um, and some of it I was figuring out, of course, as I was writing the novel, but I also wanted very much to, um, to put across my own experience of the, the aspects of, because when, um, when a family leaves a place like India, moves to the United States, which is so very different, and particularly at the time my parents did it, um, a lot of family continuity is lost, stories are lost, histories are lost. Um, on the other hand, you get to the other side and some things are gained, and that was very much what I wanted to interrogate in my first uh, uh, book. Um, I too have um, quite consciously um, incorporated, I suppose, my own diasporic viewpoint into my fictions. I, I began as a playwright, really, in Australia, and there are many works that don't concern Doa, but my, ironically, my two longest narrative works, which are Homework, which came out some many years ago now, 1999, and this one, um, are about diasporic subjects. So Homework's about a family of Goins who live in the suburbs of Sydney, and the family is um, um, fractured by uh, the, the father's almost uh, monomaniac, um, maniacal longing for Goa, and um, he's almost carrying on an enterprise of wanting um, uh, to advance the cause of uh, having the, the, the Indians out of Goa long after um, Goa has been invaded. And uh, there's all sorts of things going on in that book about the, the, the characterization of the parents, um, um, their relationship with India. Indira Gandhi is, figures as a comic kind of uh, figure in the, in the book because the parents are economic migrants, as my parents, by the way, were to Australia at the time of Indira Gandhi. And um, so that is, is different in the sense that I suppose it was... Um, I, I, was, I was asking myself at the time I began it, which was many years ago, and I was actually living in the United States at the time, where both of you have, have an association, strong association, and um, I, I think I, looking back, that I was very, I was doing my masters, and I was very aware of racism in the United States, and the history of slavery in the United States, and I had wanted to ask myself the question, what would have happened if I wasn't, if I was someone else than the person um, say the character of Mina in the, in the first novel, she's, a, she's a born in Australian Sydney, as I was. And so I wanted to, um, if you like, excavate these layers of being that might have been part of, part of a different migratory pattern than my parents' own. And I wanted to, I had one aunt who had gone, my father's sister, to Angola, and uh, this book has been written over a long period, so uh, it was re redrafted even. Um, it became much more about the um, the, the particular milieu of uh, going Catholic Brahmins who went 
um, before the uh, takeover of Goa, to other parts of the world, and in this case to Portuguese Africa, and how they were in, they were complicit in um, in Portuguese colonialism. Um, so, I, I, I want to discuss the, the new books, but before we do, I have a question. Um, I have a question about um, your, both of your debut works. Um, so, in this book called Racial Asymmetries by Soane, he does this classification of Asian American literature, um, and, and he places these works in two categories. One is of the build up to Roman, which is a coming of age story. Right, uh, so where immigrants kind of go on this trajectory and find a sense of self, right? And then the other classification he, he accords these books is that there's the expectation that the person writing them, by virtue of their ethnic belonging, are providing some some sort of authentic truth to uh, to the um, reader, right? Um, but he also suggests that as time has gone on. Um, these, these books, by, by hyphenated writers, if you will, um, have, have moved into other territory where they're not as beholden to the sense of being the cultural informant or being the person who gives some sense of the community to the, 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 the reader who is often thought of as being a white reader. Right? Um, in Only the, Only the Eyes Are Mine, Michelle, uh, I find it striking that we deal with the sexuality of an older woman. Uh, this, is, this goes against the grain of the obvious coming of age story, right? Where we, we see the second generation person as always already being a young person who's coming of age. Uh, in your book, there's almost a reversal of that trope because one finds out about this woman much later on in, in terms of her past life, right, in the United States. And um, Sunita, with um, what I find striking about homework is the ways in which the, the three children, particularly, right, and, and, and the, the protagonist, she's not a good student in comparison to her, her, her older sister, right? Uh, and yet she's so much the heart of this story. She's so much the person who keeps her family together by narrating their stories, right? Uh, and I thought that where the book departed from usual tellings of immigrant lives is that this is a family that's a mess. This is not your average, rather than the middle class family. The, the mum goes off on a bender. The father, like you said, is you know, rallying for this lost cause. And here's a daughter with antennae on her head. Right? So. Um, what do these, these other narratives, in a sense, give us that the usually told tale of immigrant success do, do not? Um, I haven't thought of it that way, and that's interesting. Um, but in, in my story, the story actually um, revolves very much about the coming of age of the older generation in India, and how her life is thwarted um, by patriarchy, by social expectations, by her uh, disabilities of uh, caste and socioeconomic status, and how that shapes her. Um, she, I mean, in some ways, this was part of my, my sense growing <coughs> up of my own grandmother, I wasn't there to see what her, what her life was like. And so the stories that I got about my parents and grandparents in India, these are filtered stories, they're cleansed stories, they're stories that try to project you know, success and all of this. But reading between the lines, I didn't imagine that's really what happened. And so I try to imagine the life of a person who had great potential, um, a young woman, but she's growing up poor, she's growing up um, under the thumb of um, you know, her father or her husband, um, and how this thwarts her life, how that, when later she comes to the United States, 
she is not able to relate to the next generation. She means well for them, but something is lost in the message because she cannot tell the truth about her own life. So, um, yeah, I was trying to get at the unspoken parts of um, the diaspora story. That was the Indian, yeah? That's it's half, half in India and half in the United States. Yeah. Um, Benny mentioned homework as the example for mine. For just also, I mean, the family, incidentally, in Saldar is also dysfunctional in a completely different way. They're, they're, the father's a, a patriot, a Portuguese patriot, and he can't believe that the empire, Portuguese empire is going to end, he's a civil servant, and so on. But I'll just briefly on, on, on homework say that. Um, um, at the time, I was quite young, and I, I don't think I was actually conscious that I wanted to write a, a narrative that was um, uh, demystifying the immigrant story of success. But I think, generally, I had, you know, I'm a, I was, I'm a big reader, and, and a lot of, I feel, uh, genuinely interesting literature in, in, in world literature has concerned itself with this um, business of t truth telling about things like this. So I guess at the time my models weren't even immigrant stories, they were things like, I mean Kafka was a big influence at that time and you know the family and the metamorphosis completely chaotic and the, the, the boy, he's a, the sleepwalker stand so wakes up and he's, you know, he's a cockroach so there was a similar um, kind of metaphysical or uh, some other thing going on for me with, with that. But yes, the, uh, now I'm, more conscious, I'm now more conscious though of speaking about this, and also in relation to the stories we tell, I think there's a funny thing happening, sorry to speak of social media so early in the piece, but where we, we seem to be interested in narratives of success, whereas um, amazing literature, Anna Karenina, was not concerned with that. It's concerned um, failing and uh, things falling apart and how holding how human beings hold things together and how they you know how they suffer as well and I think these are the things that did interest me in terms of uh, um, diaspora and homework well it's a very in your face um, account of a family that is is, is, is dysfunctional and falling apart and and a lot of the baggage, and literally the mother at one point who um, has this, she also has her, her there's mental illness in the book and metaphors of, um, of, if you like, bipolarity even, where the mother is becoming a bird and so on. She keeps suitcases, so they go to India and they keep, she keeps the suitcases and can't unpack them. And uh, these were all, if you like, uh, metaphors in the book of, um, of, this, this uh, disarray, psycho psychological but also um, social from their micro... And it's a comic, mine is a coming of age, so the, the uh, child narrator is a kind of tragic comic um, narrator who, who goes from, I think, about age 6 to 15 or something in homework, if I Um, if, if I could impose on both of you to read uh, a little bit from your works, um, I think, Lucia, you've got uh, a passage from your first book, is that right? And Sunita from the new work. So if we could do that. Because it's always nice, I think, for the audience to hear directly from the reader, from, from the writers, um, as they read from the work. So. Um, or did I have it on my phone? Um, this is a scene uh, in which the, well, one of the two main characters, Mira, who's the younger generation born in the United States, she's going to the Hindu temple with her aunt Sita, uh, who's the other main character, who's an immigrant. Um, they're in California. As Mira stepped onto the purple carpet, she reflectively grasped clasped her hands before her face. Her mobile phone rang, the special tone indicating Rajan's call. Stepping back, she flipped the slim, the slim phone to her ear. Hey, Rajan, she said. Bitu, hey, can you join me for dinner tonight? One of our drug reps is taking a group of us to Lakab. It'll be fun. 
I don't think so, babe. I'm here at the temple with Ajayi Kudra. I was planning to eat at home with the family tonight. Oh, come on, he condoled. It's still early. You could be out of there before six. That'll give you plenty of time to get dressed. Vince will be there. Remember I told you he's our new administrator? It'll be a good chance for him to meet you. Mary inhales audibly. A year ago, the prospect of such an evening would have excited her, but lately she was rarely in the mood. Between the wine and the souffle, their banter about hospital politics did not much interest her. Well, all right, I'll call you when I get home. Great, wear that black dress with the red roses down the front, you know, the one you wore to Richardson Garden Party. Mira bit her lip. She thought of what Robbie would say when he saw her dash out the door arrayed in her finest evening wear. Oh look, another night where you get to play the sidekick to the great Rajan sideshow. Okay, I'll call you later, she says, hanging up the phone. She joined her aunt, cross-legged on the carpet. Today we will do a special puja for your wedding, Sita said, lifting up, sitting up after a few moments, for your future happiness and for children. Mira pulled two $20 bills from her purse and handed them to Sita. You talk to the pujari. I don't know how to ask for the right stuff, she said. Sita took the bills and made her way to speak to one of the dhoti clad pujaris who stood chatting at the side of the temple area. Mira waited, surveying the people lost in their devotion. She felt like an intruder. She watched Sita speak earnestly to a bare-chested, middle-aged pujari who nodded with interest. His white brown and string stood out sharply against the dark, flaccid folds of his stomach. Someone like him would soon preside over her own marriage. She thought of that day, the invocations and incantations of the Pujari for herself and Rajan. Stepping around a small flame in a large hall resplendent with flowers, the perfume of incense, the scent of coconut, the smell of crackling ghee. Though theirs would be primarily an Indian wedding, Mira had insisted on finding some place for her two best friends to stand as bridesmaids in shimmering saris. Afterwards, she and Rajan would sit on golden thrones upon a raised dais covered in vermilion carpeting to greet their well-wishers. So much color, she thought. It will be really beautiful. The image of her and Rajan together upon the bridal thrones struck her as romantic. She in a red silk, in red silk spun with pure gold, he in a fine suit. But it was only an image, a frozen moment. She had a hard time imagining what lay beyond. Then an alternate image invaded her mind. She pictured Michael sitting next to her. It startled her, the thought of his slender frame and auburn skin swathed in saffron-colored silks, a peacock feather dancing atop his headdress. No, no, it would not have worked. He would not have been able to fit in with the sight of my life. She remembered the coolness with which her aunt and father had always received him, the way they had pointedly excused, excluded him from her graduation celebration, even though he had been in her circle of friends, her circle of friends throughout her college years. Michael's family was from Mexico, and she knew that her elders had feared the idea of her romantic involvement with him, though they certainly had suspected it. Never did she have the heart to tell them openly that their fears were already realized. Ironic, she mused, running her fingers against the deep brown of her skin, the deep brown skin on the backs of her hands, that the same sorts of prejudice that Apuji had held against Michael are what Rajan fears his parents will hold against me. Wrong skin color, wrong background, wrong ancestry, not Indian enough. She felt a pang of guilt as she acknowledged that Rajan was at least willing to stand up for her against his family, which she had never done for Michael. Um, just before I read, I'll just let you know, because some of you may not know that Saldad is a Portuguese word, and that's the name of this second book of mine, called, uh, which means longing for lost things in Portuguese. And it's a particularly Portuguese word, it's untranslatable, we think, and um, it's a kind of mood, it's associated with fado music, and they think it arose with the um, feeling that sailors had when the so-called discovery period happened, so-called discoveries, um, of India and so on, Lasco de Gama, Albuquerque, and um, it, they were lot, They missed their homes and families in, in Portugal, and this this word arose 
um, I've sort of reclaimed it in this, this, for this book and for this narrator. And the other thing is that the Carnation Revolution was the Portuguese Revolution in 1954 when um, Port Portugal liberated itself from the dictatorship of Antonio Salazar. So I'll just read a little bit. This is at the end when the character is, um, she's born in Angola, in Benguela, in the late 50s, and um, she's forced in 1975, when Angola became independent, uh, to choose if she's Indian or Portuguese. She's born in Angola, so she thinks she's Angola. I did not believe what my mother had said about the dead, until I dreamt I saw my father just this way, walking backward, his face to me, his feet headed toward oblivion. There was a wound on his forehead, red and large as a carnation in full bloom. In the dream, I wanted to touch this carnation, to carry it off, but my arm extended outward and could not reach. I cried out and then awoke to find myself in a room not my own. Cots configured dormitory style, crowded, noisy, it was not a place I recognised. It was not a jail, although it may well have been, for there were bars on the windows. At night, bats flew in, leaving a fetid mess, and there were so many mosquitoes I could not sleep for the buzzing at my ears. She goes on to have some dreams and nightmares about the circumstances um, just before she had to leave Angola. Of a morning, my eyes felt heavy, worlds turned in the time between closing and opening them, and my nightie was saturated with sweat. I would see women wearing white dotis reapplying disinfectant to the floors, but the smells that returned only hours after, mine no less than anyone else's, were invariably human. Apparently, I was in quarantine because of fears that, having come from Africa, I might infect someone with a tropical disease. How did I know this? Like most things about this country, this terra incognita, which I hesitate to call home, it came to me only later, after much bewilderment and angst. Other women moved about me, their saris and salva camisas rustling, their anklets and bangles tinkling like bells. They gawked and smiled, and their presence was at once intimidating and comforting, as assuming I understood, they rapidly fired off conversation in Hindi or Marathi. Out of pity for my incomprehension or my poor appetite, or ha perhaps my being alone, they offered me sweets from their parties. I took them, but they were sickly, saturated with ghee. Eventually I learned some words, to ask for water, to ask for fruit, to ask what day it was. Time seemed to have slowed or halted. They asked me my name and I lied. Masquerading, I said, my name is Saudal, and to my surprise, no one unmasked me. I was so lonely, yet not at all alone, a paradox I thought of while taking the last of the puris out to feed the birds on the balcony. From here I would watch the huge dusty crows vying for crumbs with the small undaunted sparrows. A few fair-skinned women were here too. They were hippies I discerned from their dreadlocks. They kept to themselves and were often to be found asleep in the old boat, cane chairs, sleepwalking, barefoot, to bump babies from the wardens. The acrid smoke would drift in with all the other strong smells, frying food, incense and factory emissions, and the alien noises, the call to prayer, a, a cricket bat, plucking at a cricket ball, <coughs> children running and laughing. Later, when I was let out, I played games of rummy and drafts with a few of these children. They showed me the rules and I observed them closely, like a spy deciphering a code. <coughs> One girl my age, called Mira, befriended me. She, was told, she told me she was coming home from the Gulf, where she had been to see her husband. She was so young, I did not believe that she was already married, but she showed me the proofs by way of her Mangala Sutra and the intricate <coughs> but faded designs of the Mendi on her hands. I'll just read a little bit more again. Um, it was only a few days, yet all this came to be routine, and those around me almost familiar when one morning I was summoned to a large administrative outbuilding. My passport, papers and suitcase were summarily given back to me and I was told to get ready. A boat had been booked for me and I would be escorted to the docks by noon. I got dressed, pulling on, dread, on jeans and a shirt, clothes I had almost forgotten. 
The streets through the taxi window were thronged with people and slums rose into view at every turn. I arrived at a harbour called Mazagon, which had once been a fishing village facing out towards the sea. A sea that, like the last, could disclose so many secrets and so many expectations. Almost a second nature, I knew it was the Arabian Sea, and this was Bombay. Thank you. Um, I've got a sort of similar question for both of you, um, as it comes to me, based on what you just read, but I'll, I'll ask them separately. So, Usha, um, following the trajectory of your books, the first clearly set in two different places, the second about Idaho is more of a memoir. No, is, is that, that one's fiction as well? That, that, the second one's fiction as well. But then in the third one, The Legend of Dharanara, you, you return, in a sense, to India, uh, or all your characters do in, in the book. Um, I'm thinking about places and memory, and what causes a writer to kind of revisit places or visit them for the first time, and how much that's bound by memory, both as an act of recovery, but also being made for the first time. Because it feels to me as if your books are constantly looking for a sense of place, but also a sense of self for, for the characters. Um, yeah, I think that's true, although I don't think I knew that until you said it. Um, uh, so the second book about Idaho, it is set in my hometown, and it, um, it, it is it is me, I think, trying to excavate the, the feeling of um, looking again at my home. Uh, it is a story in which the main character is a boy. So it is um, not what you would call autobiographical, except in the sense that it is me, I think, trying to understand that world from the point of view of a member of the dominant community of that world. Um, then. About this, soon after I'd written that, I moved to India, and um, I had been traveling around India a lot, and in a way discovering India, what its history, its uh, geography, melding my own memories of visiting it as a child, or what I learned about it from my family, with what I was seeing about it now, um, and I think that informed like very strongly my idea for the, the my second and third novel, uh, The Legend of Miranara, which is set in the past. And um, I also just wanted to add that thinking about this now, one of the things I realized is that the both of the stories that I've written that take place in India, or in the first case half of the book takes place in India, both of them take place in the past. Um, and I think that's in part because my relationship to India in some ways through my parents is in the past. And coming here as an adult and realizing, you know, being um, put into the modern milieu and the modern conversation and politics that goes on, I don't, I don't feel I have the confidence to comment on that or to set a story in this complex, you know, sort of political landscape, um, or I don't feel like I'm entitled to it in the same way that I'm entitled to India's past, which, you know, it's something that I've just been thinking the last couple of days. Um, I'm really um, remarking on what Usha just said because I feel very much the same. In fact, one of the projects I've had while being here was not only to um, promote Sadar, but to do some research about contemporary India or post-partition it was India, and I do feel overwhelmed also by that, and I, it's an acute kind of observation you've made about why you may have chosen to write about the past, and it resonates with me only now, so you've also made me aware of something. Um, that my parents migrated in 71, 72 to Australia, my father's family are kind of very um, Portuguese identified, going family from Salsa. My mother is from Aldena, but was born and um, grew up in Bombay until she was about 17, and then came to God. 
And um, so memory and place, as you were saying, um, yeah, I think they're, they're things which... Actually, so, so there, there's a question that, that yeah. I'm not asking specifically yeah, okay, about. Sure. Um, um, and, and thank you for that insightful comment, Misha. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. But the, the, the additional thing I want to ask you, uh, particularly about South Earth, is um, I think that there's been, in perhaps the last decade or so, a recovery for Goans of Portuguese Africa. Uh, and, and the reason I say this is because for a very long time, the diasporic imaginary for Goans was very much kind of taken over by the British experience, and particularly British East Africa. So, Goans are, are in this really interesting position where they sent off their people to both British East Africa, but then also Portuguese Africa, right? But um, one tended to see a lot more of the representation of British East Africa, uh, and then with the publication of Skin, for example, in 2000 or 2001, we have this revisiting of the legacy of the Indian Ocean slave trade, um, which, which the Portuguese and Goans participated in. Um, there's the, the story of Aquino Briganza uh, from Mozambique, uh, of Sita Bayesh from Angola, um, and Ramona Lavalka, our, our greatest living artist who, who lived in Mozambique. Um, for you, as somebody who grew up in Australia, and, and, and I'm thinking here of how Sandal is the memory of a memory, which is based partially on the story of an ancestor, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, not yeah. really. Um, my, I have a, one of my dad's sisters who went in right. the 50s with her husband who was going to Angola, and they did leave in 75, but that's the, the only biographical okay. details, apart right. from the fact that they also had a daughter who came for some time right. to Goa for a year in the year, but they then migrated to Lisbon. So um, that was just a, a, I guess there was an interest in, and I'm looking back to and wondering at certain choices, because as I said, I started it when I was 24 and living in the States, but um, I think it was due to the fact that my, my experience of, of being going was um, through this prism of my father's family, particularly because we would come and stay with dad's side, my mother's family didn't have a home in the north anymore, so we would come every three or four years when I was young, and I was, it was in, oh it's nearly, apparently time's nearly, oh, five minutes, go on. Uh, so that, yeah, as you say, a memory of a memory, in fact, so that is, construct, it's a constructive memory, and I, I am very conscious that uh, I've not been there, and that is this an enterprise in fiction that's um, ethical in the 21st century and so on? And how does memory and imagination, how do you graft um, your imagination on something that you've not lived through or felt? And what does, yeah, what does that involve? But um, I'm, I do think that a lot of my experience, the, the thing I was also trying to tease out in this book was about caste. And I, I mean, in a strange way, it's not obvious. It comes through through the um, way in which oppression because of race is experienced by the black characters who are servants of the of these Goans in Angola, and the fate that befalls them, the, the the greater level of choicelessness that they suffer when compared to the narrator Marina Christina's family members who get to choose at least. They may not get to choose to go to to Lisbon, but um, so. I was interested in cast and I was, uh, and those things have come from my direct memory of Goa, like how cast is inflected, how people are inscribed because of what their name is, whether they were Catholic, whether they were Hindu, um, how, how um, the poor experience their faith, that was something that came through because of my relationship to Goa, my direct memories of Goa, yeah. Um, in in the, the couple of minutes we have left, if we could close with just uh, a, a sort of a very brief kind of comment about what's next for both of you. Um, well, I'm still interestingly, uh, well, interestingly to me anyway, um, still very much uh, somehow in this run of the, the next novel that I'm working on is also set in India in the past, um, this time in the um, colonial past, 
and I'm still at the early stages reading and kind of researching, but that's the story. Usha and I are carrying the same authorial journey. <laughs> Mine is the same answer. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I was interested to see, because I've had such a goal invested viewpoint uh, as a human being of India in, 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 in version of that. So, what, what was the also British colonial experience? My mother was born in British Bombay, and of course, Britain and Portugal were interesting colonial. Uh, uh, What's the word? Um, friends. Friends. <laughs> um, yeah, and friends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Forged all sorts of strange alliances, so dowries and so on. So, um, through Bombay. Through Bombay. And I, I went to the north as, uh, on this trip. I've been here since September as part of this research. But I can tell you, like Usha has said, I feel very unqualified to speak about contemporary India. Um, it's a strange experience being a diasporic person and then the time lag of things and into this complexity, contemporary complexity is unfathomable. Yeah. Well, thank you very much both um, and thank you for being here and uh, our authors will be happy to speak with you later. Thanks very much. A round of applause, please.